All right, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Vlad Grigorescu. I'm a member of the Bro team. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the past on uh, analyzer development. Um, and I'm talking about some of the new analyzers that Seth mentioned yesterday in 2.3. And we designed some exercises to kind of get familiar with some of those, but realized that it'd be a lot more useful if instead of kind of going through well, here's radius and how it works and what you can kind of do with it with Bro. Instead, we focus more on the skills of when a new analyzer comes out and a few come out with each new release, where can I get the documentation for what's going on? How can I understand what's going on? And how can I start writing scripts for it? So more just general skills with working with the documentation, which has a few uh, oddities in the way it's laid out, um, and then figuring out how to start writing scripts based on that. Um, and then just from an operational standpoint, there's a number of very basic skills that aren't really covered in other places. So how do I create a new log? How do I create a new notice? How do I start you know, refining some of those notices so I can start whitelisting that one professor that's doing something stupid? And, um, and so that, that's really the goal of these exercises of as we're working with some of these new analyzers, uh, SNMP, Radius, um, Grid FTP, uh, just trying to generalize the skill set of accessing the documentation and starting to write some of these scripts that uh, are quite useful in your kind of day-to-day -day environment. Um, so much like the other exercises, I'll be floating around, other people will be floating around, wave someone down if you have a question, if you get stuck, and then probably about 10 or 15 minutes before the end of it, I'll come back up here and go through some of the solutions. Um, so have fun. All right, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start going over some of the solutions to this. Uh, it was pointed out to me about halfway through the exercise that people, a lot of people couldn't even do part A because, hey, those are links that go out to the internets and many people can't get out to the internets. Um, so I'm gonna go through this in a bit more detail just for those that can actually get out there. Um, so the Bro documentation, um, it ships with Bro. You would have to uh, run make doc and set up a few things in order to get nice HTML documentation like we have on the website. Um, most people just kind of go out to the website and click the giant documentation link at the top of bro.org. Um, and then here we have both the Bro manual for the latest stable release, 2.3. And then we have the bro manual for whatever Git master currently is. Um, if you're not running one of those two, then it's going to be a bit more complicated. Um, and it goes through just some of the backgrounds, what a bro cluster is, the actual setup. And then um, we get into um, the kind of reference section, which we've, is what a lot of the questions were geared towards. Of as you start writing scripts, you need to know, um, you know what which event do I handle? What parameters are being passed to this event? And what types are those parameters? Uh, if it's a record, what are the field names? And, and so on and so forth. Um, so there, there are a couple really key portions to the uh, script reference there. Um, so we have the kind of list of protocol analyzers and the list of file analyzers. And those are handy just because it's a more logical grouping scrolling doesn't work. Um, so that for IRC, for example, I can go in and I can see all the events that IRC might generate. So uh, for my IRC script, I can try to go through and pick the most specific event that I care about where um, you know, maybe I'm looking for C2 communication over IRC because it's 10 years ago. Um, and maybe I don't want to handle the IRC message events. Maybe I actually want to go through and look at um, you know, a private message um, or you look at some, some of these related informations uh, or re related events where maybe it's, uh, maybe I'm interested in nick change and so on and so forth. So this will go through and essentially define that the IRC nick message event will give you C, which is a connection uh, type object, uh, whether it is ridge, who, and the new nick, and then it'll go through and give you a short description of each of these parameters. Um, it's very similar, we have the file analyzer stuff, so X509, if you want to start doing some work with that to 
uh, look for certain attributes uh, in a certificate, you would go to the file analyzer reference, go down to X509, and start taking a look at the events that are generated and the types that are being passed. Um, another handy uh, section to the script reference is the package index, which again, I'm kind of focusing on these. Uh, the information is accessible through many different vectors. Um, these just try to group them a bit more logically and try to uh, make it easier to see, you know, related things. Um, so, uh, I don't know, let's say that I want, I care about the notice framework. Um, then I can go and kind of see the different portions of the, the, the different files that make it up. Um, uh, so here, you know, the weirds, the weird log also comes out of the notice framework. And I can see that this is the file that's actually being generated. Um, and I can kind of dive down and, and start to figure out what's actually going in this file where, you know, there's a table where you can define what to do for different weirds where maybe you're getting overloaded by something in your weird.log that you really don't care about. You can go into this table and you can mute that. Um, or you can set, I guess, predefined weird hosts that you just ignore. Um, so a, a lot of, uh, all of these are, you know, redefinable constants. Um, and just uh, lots of knobs that you can go through and, and tweak, and a lot of these are just kind of hidden away um, if you don't really know where to look. Um, if you don't kind of go through and read the scripts, you're not really gonna pull these out unless you go through and look at the documentation. Um, and finally, the, the last section I focused on here um, was this uh, built-in function documentation. Um, so if you look at the package index, um, there's this base.bif, which again, multiple ways of accessing this. Um, so in Bro, a built-in function is a function written in C or C++ that will uh, tie into the rest of Bro. So certain, um, certain actions or certain operations that really need, should happen quickly or tie into other libraries uh, they, they don't get executed as script functions. They actually uh, are pre-compiled uh, bro functions that are available to you when you're running bro. Um, so, and you know, the, the, these are obviously grouped as well. Um, so we can go through and look at know, strings, for example. And we see that we have a bunch of functions here for dealing with strings and these are all implemented behind the scenes for you, so it's, it's faster than it normally would be if you're just trying to do this with a script. Um, so, for example, the, the exercise we had yesterday of print the string by removing all instances of a certain letter, you could just do this replacement function, or you give it a regular expression for that letter, and the replacement is an empty string, and you would just do it that way and get better performance. Um, so built-in functions is something to try to keep in mind, especially when you're doing uh, kind of heavy lifting operations or things that happen a lot, just to make sure that you can run your script in production and it won't just bring everything to a halt. Um, so I'm going to yeah, skip over the exercise. The solutions are up. Um, I guess I could go and pull those up. Um, so especially for the documentation questions, I'm not gonna kind of go through here because the, the solutions will go through um, and just uh, explain kind of how to get from the protocol analyzer reference to you know, click on SNMP, take a look at a certain type and see what versions are mentioned, take a look at an event and look at the parameters that are being passed. Um, any questions with the documentation section for those of you that could actually internet out to it? Okay. Um, the second section to this was really just taking one of these uh, exported um, variables and being able to redefine it. Um, so similar to what we were working on yesterday, anything that, is a, that has the and readf uh, attribute on it, you can then go and redefine. So maybe um, you want to fine tune some of the pre-configured defaults of at what size of this transfer do I wanna start considering an, a, a grid FTP connection, you would just add something like this in your local dot bro um, to change that. Okay. 
All right, so now we get to the interesting part. Uh, it's quite handy. I, I'm not sure how it came around, but. Uh, so for those that maybe can't read this, well, they probably won't be able to read that either. But um, I threw these up on tiny URL just to make it a bit easier. Um, as VG, BC, 1, Vigorescu, Brocon, 1. Um, but uh, so all this does, um, we're extending the radius log to uh, create this new remote CC field. And essentially, when we want to extend a log, we're, all we're doing is redefining uh, a record. Um, so most of the scripts have this info record. This is really what's being sent to the logging framework. So if you add a field and it has this and log attribute on it, um, well, it's going to go ahead and, and be logged further down the stream. Um, so we have a radius message, and then we do a bit of hand waving to deal with some of radi radius's quirks. And that really what you're seeing is the UDP traffic between the radius client and the radius server. So you're going to see a lot of radius transactions over that same connection. So we need to kind of identify that by a specific transaction ID. Um, so that, that's, that, that would all be explained in the, in the documentation for the radius message event and for that C$ sign radius field. Um, and essentially all we're doing is, do we have a remote IP field set? Because here we, this is an optional field, or sorry, remote IP is an optional field that's defined in, in um, base rate protocols radius. So whenever you see an optional field like that, it's probably a good idea to check that that field has been set um, using uh, this uh, kind of quirky little operator of question mark dollar sign. Um, so if that's not set, we're just going to stop doing anything. Otherwise, we're going to look up the location for that IP. This will go out to the GeoIP database. Uh, we're going to get the country code for it, and we're just going to set um, info remote CC to that country code, and then we put this info record back into the C radius trans ID field. And then if we go through and run this, we see that we have a radius log. It's me logging in, allegedly. And hey, look, I'm coming from Romania. Um, so just a really quick extending a, fee extending a log, redefing a record. Um, Next one up is going out through and creating a new notice. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this is just kind of boilerplate, uh, where you're loading the notice framework, you're exporting and redefining this notice type, uh, and you're essentially just plus equaling a new notice type. Um, and then this is very similar to what we had before with a few more, a, a bit more logic to fill in some more information so that when your notice fires, you actually have a username um, and you have the source IP and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, part of, the, part of these exercises also to have some boilerplate code ready so that when you want to create a new notice, you have something you can kind of reference. And I still do this if I will go to another script and steal the notice from that because I don't necessarily remember each of the different field names in this thing. Um, but, you know, all we're doing here is we're constructing a new record uh, and we're, uh, that's what these square brackets are denoting and the usual notation of dollar sign field name and value. Um, and then we're going through and putting in, you know, the type of notice, uh, the connection ID, the UID, the message, which we defined here of, hey, we had a VPN login from Romania, maybe you want to take a look at this. Um, and then, we're putting in if it succeeded or failed, what the remote IP was. Um, and then we're also doing this identifier thing where uh, if we see multiple logins for the same user uh, from the same IP, we're only going to get one notice for that. Um, so that just kind of ties into the notice suppression stuff. So you're not uh, bombarding your IR team with emails every time 
something happens uh, and they, they just have uh, a way to deduplicate that event. Yep. What was the uh, tiny URL for that one? Uh, VGBC2. And there, 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 there's actually a running theme there. So VGBC3. Um, so generally when you're writing a bro script, you want to avoid hard coding things that other sites might want to configure or that maybe you'll want to configure down to the road. So, you know, boo Romania, but maybe you want to add some more countries to it further down the line. So what this exercise was doing was just kind of defining a new redefinable constant of, well, which countries do we really want to know about when we see VPN logins from there? Um, let's add China to the list because we like China. Um, and then just essentially changing this logic a little bit in that now we're checking to see if uh, the remote country code is in our list of watch countries. And then um, I think the only other change was that now we need to include an actual string for what country they're coming from as opposed to just hard coding it as Romania. Um, the compare for the IP address. So what we're doing is first we're looking it up in GUIP with this uh, lookup location um, somewhere. Ah, uh, yeah, so one thing I forgot to mention is that this is just building on the previous script. So this is our country code script that is adding the remote country code to the log, to the record. And then in our main script, that the one that's uh, just generating this detection, we're loading this radius country code script. And when we go to log the radius event, or when we go to log the radius message, we know that we have this remote country code attribute already set. Um, and then all we're doing is checking to see if that's in our list of watch countries. Um, so this, uh, what we're doing here is we're, we're using this lookup location uh, built-in function that will pull up your GOIP database and throw the IP in there. So that's an example of one of those built-in functions that will just tie into the GOIP library. Oops. So VGBC4. Um, so here, again, we're keeping the radius country code script that extends our log. We're keeping the Romanian VPN script that will generate a notice whenever we see a login from Romania. And what we're starting to do is start to uh, refine our notice a little bit, where really the way that this is written, what we're looking for are login attempts. Um, so we don't really care whether it was a, a successful or failed uh, connection, it'll still generate a notice. And maybe our IR team is unhappy with that and you wanna refine that to only care about successful logins. So this is an example of how you would take a notice and start refining it with uh, using this notice policy uh, feature of the notice framework. Um, so Whenever a notice fires, this, this notice policy hook uh, will go through and will let you modify it. Maybe you want to take a more severe action for certain things on your blacklist, or maybe uh, if you just had a watch list to begin with, um, you can increase the severity, decrease the severity. Maybe you can add some extra information into the logs. Um, essentially, what we're doing here is we're checking to see if this is a radius Romanian VPN attempt notice, um, and then if the sub-message we're setting in that notice call, if that's not success, well, we don't actually want to do anything. Um, so the easiest way to do that is to set the actions associated with the notice to an empty set. Um, so by default, every notice will get logged, and then you can email it to certain teams, you can maybe create a ticket, or maybe you can even go out and block this IP or suspend this user account or something like that. Going the, the opposite way, if you have no actions, this won't even show up in your notice log. Um, so this is just a, a quick and easy way to go ahead and suppress a notice that maybe you don't care about. Um, 
Uh, this one right there, I just looked at. Maybe. Ah, so this one, uh, it was a very similar example. Uh, let me actually go back really quick. I can computer. This was essentially just testing this with two different PCAPs. So this was a PCAP that had a success uh, result, and we see that we got a notice on this. Sure enough, we had a VPN login from Romania. Um, and then if we look at VGBC5, that was a different PCAP that uh, it failed. Um, and we see that we have no notice log in that case. So just a quick demo to show that our notice policy is actually working as intended. And then the last thing I'll mention is this uh, dump events tool. So again, very, uh, you know, going through the documentation, trying to figure out which events you want to handle, uh, really useful and critical to know as you're going through and starting to write some of these scripts. Sometimes you just want to take this awesome shortcut that Robin put in of I have a PCAP, let me just see all the events that are firing on this. And then I can kind of see uh, for each event, so this is the new connection event, for instance. And I can go through and I can see that the first argument I have is this connection, and here's the information I have available in that connection record. Um, and so just by loading this uh, misc dump events uh, script, it'll just print out to STD out all the events, all the arguments that are being in there. Um, so if, you, if you're able to have a small PCAP identifying the issue you're trying to detect, you can just run it through this and get, a hand, get an idea of what events you, you want, want to take a look at. And subsequently, how many times is this event firing? Is there a better event that I can handle that fires less frequently so I can get better performance out of this? Um, and, and the one caveat on there, if you look at the exercise, is that events that aren't being handled by Burrow scripts aren't being generated, so you won't ever see them. Um, so generally for the very low level events like new packet, uh, if those aren't being handled by the base scripts, there's probably a good reason for why you don't want to do that for every single packet you're seeing. Um, but it is something to keep in mind that that isn't the full complement of events that Bro actually has available. You may just might want to double, double check if you really want to handle a new event and, and what the implications of that might be. Um, so over my time, but that's all I had. Any, any questions now or feel free to flag me down and I can definitely, I'm more than happy to talk bro and, and answer any other questions.